Well, a very good morning to you one and all, and welcome to St. Columbus for our Sunday morning uh, service. It's supposed to be the summertime, <laughs> uh, but we're just glad of weather of any description as we meet together at God's house today. And of course, we extend a hearty welcome to all those who will watch our morning service later today or through the week uh, on our recorded platforms. Uh, you're very much in our thoughts and our prayers, and uh, we look forward, all of us, to the day when we can meet together uh, all in one place in fellowship as we remember it. But for now, we remain in semi pandemic conditions, I suppose, is the right way to put it, and um, even though some further uh, liberations are coming our way at the end of the month, uh, through the month of July, things will pretty much be as they have been over the last number of weeks, but you're all welcome to our service of worship. Just a few informal announcements before uh, we continue on in, in worship together. Uh, next Sunday, our morning worship will be in the hall in St. Patrick's. Uh, the work has begun and the church is shut for three, four, four and a half months or so. Uh, so we have set up the hall as best we can to accommodate morning worship. And booking in is required, please, through the office telephone number. And uh, Ruth will be in and out at, at, at a few lunch times, and Emma and I to check and clear the messages. So please do come along and join us in worship next Sunday. Uh, we're hosting a number of summer sins. I hope you've already uh, devoured this in the communications that you've got by letter or online. Uh, four Wednesday evenings in total through July and August. Uh, when we will gather just to sing God's praises, uh, some favourite hymns. Of course, there's fundraising behind all of this. Uh, we would love you to sponsor a favourite hymn, uh, at, at least a tenor, uh, to, to, to help with the uh, refilling of our, of our coffers. Uh, now that we've started the big building project down in St. Patrick's, uh, please again just nominate your favourite hymn leave an answer machine message in the church office number. We'll get back to you and tell you which church and which date your hymn is going to be uh, sung. Uh, our next two dates are the 21st and the 28th of July. Uh, all these summer sings are Wednesday evenings at half seven. Uh, and uh, 21st of July will be Valley Club. The 28th of July will be here in St. Columbus. Uh, so there's a bit of friendly rivalry going on between the three congregations. Uh, the Valley Club folk already said to me, tell them in St. Columbus uh, that they're the third best singers in the park. So there you are, being grieved, I hope, and be motivated positively to come and show them they're wrong. I can only teach you, but only half teach you. Really. They, uh, so come and, come and join in, folks. Come and be a part of our fundraising idea. Uh, even though it's behind masks, we still love uh, the ability that we have to sing uh, in some way God's praise and a lovely way to spend an evening just uh, around these words of Scripture set to music. So please do get your nominations flowing into the church office number uh, and uh, be booked in to come and sing uh, in these dates, two in July and two in August. I suppose another long-term date to put in your radar is a, an envelope drop-off here in St. Columbus at the end of the month, the 31st of July. If you know anyone who uh, does not feel able to come to church or, or is shielding still, uh, it might be a kindness to inform them that we will be here on that day, uh, the 31st of July, and they or a friend could drive in and out of the car park without leaving their vehicle if they have envelopes gathered up uh, that they haven't been able to get to church. Uh, that might be a useful thing to pass the word around. Folks, we come now to the beginning, more formal beginning of our service, and a quotation uh, from Psalm 24. 
and I would invite you all to please stand as we begin our worship. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. We remain standing to sing our opening hymn if you're using a hymn book. It's number 652. Uh, if not, the words will be on the screen. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. Please will you remember him 
as he tries to recover and as they try to improve his general uh, quality of life. Uh, Liz is obviously his one visitor down to the Royal and uh, will be booked in this morning to go and call with Les. So please, please, will you remember the family in your prayers. And secondly, our curate's about to be a bridesmaid uh, on Saturday coming. Uh, Emma's sister uh, is to be married. She's marrying an Estonian halfway up the Shankill Road in Belfast. <laughs> now that could be very, very interesting for all kinds of reasons. But uh, can you remember the Carson clan? Uh, Emma and her sister Lisa, who we all know, uh, singing and playing within church and then online uh, as that big day approaches. Can we just pause for a moment and pray now for, for these needs and others that you know in your heart that you bring with you as a burden to the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Lord, for dear Liz and Les, like so many uh, here in St. Columbus, they are such a faithful part of our church family. We remember with thanksgiving Les's uncomplaining spirit and courage, but we genuinely remember in prayer our fear and Liz's fear and the family's fear for his well-being. And we pray for all the staff operating on Les and helping him and assisting him, that you would give them great gentleness and professionalism and wisdom to do the best that they can. Lord, it is our humble, straightforward prayer of faith that he and all those we know who are undergoing treatment, who are in hospital, uh, being cared for at home, finding these days frightening and confusing, that you, Lord, would give them all help and that you would be close to them, each one. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Lord, for uh, Emma and her whole family circle uh, and a big wedding coming up on Saturday. And Lord, for Ryan and Claire from our own congregation being married in St. Patrick's for Shane with our church being out of commission uh, on Thursday. We pray for these couples, for all the families they represent. Lord, for fun, for precious time, uh, for busyness, for organization. Lord, we pray that they will have days never to be forgotten. Just to help all those whose task it is to make the day go well in a joyful and a holy way. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and join together in alternate verses as we read Psalm 24. And you will see uh, the, the, the first verse, the odd verses I will read. Please will you respond in the even numbered verses in red print. Let's stand and read. The earth is the Lord's, and all that therein is, the compass of the world, and they that dwell therein. For you have found it among the seas, and have buried it among the dust. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall rise up in his holy place? He and he that hath been man's and the pure heart, and that hath not the hill of the He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, even of them that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. He is the King of glory, it is his Lord strong and Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, 
and the King of glory shall come in. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Amen. We remain standing to affirm that we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find in red print of the script. Say it together, I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe that Jesus Christ, His only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered from the was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into hell. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of the sins, the resurrection of the body. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. Jesus cures a blind man at Bethesda. They came to Bethesda. Some people brought a blind man and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands upon him, he asked him, Can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything. Then he sent him away to his village, saying, Do not even go into the village. Then Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus went all with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them then again, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We take a moment to pray now. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word which is spoken throughout generations. We pray, speak to us today. That we would hear the words of Jesus and know them deeply in our hearts. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I wonder if you have ever seen the documentary, Who Do You Think You Are? It's a documentary, BBC, great, uh, in which celebrities, retired politicians, people of note, uh, research their roots through hundreds of years to discover more about their family history. And there's always something really dramatic that comes out of the episode, and it's usually towards the end. Things like Ainsley Harriet finding out that his great great grandmother was a slave and was bought when she was just two years old. And then his great 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 grandfather came from a long line of white slave owners. Or Danny Dyer of EastEnders and Hardman fame discovering that he actually has royal lineage and he's descended from William the Conqueror and Edward III and He's related to Henry VIII's advisor Thomas Cromwell. Quite 
Strand used to say, the lesson is many more stories besides this. But the, the documentary, the series, sort of points to the fact that people long to know who they are, where they come from, where their family comes from, what their history is, who they're descended from, who they truly are. Jesus, if he asked him the question, would know the answer fully. He knew full well who he was or is. It's not quite who you think you are, but rather, I know who I am. Do you know who I am? Jesus asks his disciples these questions. Who do people say I am? Who do you say that I am? It's quite interesting that this instance of Jesus asking his disciples these questions comes just after he heals a blind man. Here in Bethesda, and just outside the village, this man receives his sight. He's brought out of the village to a quieter place. Jesus places his saliva on his eyes, he places his hands upon him and asks him, what he sees. And something begins to happen. The blind man is able to see people as though they were trees walking around. He receives partial vision. Jesus lifts hands on him a second time and this time the man receives his full sight. He's lay on this two stage journey from complete blindness to seeing dimly to seeing in two stages. And that is how the people who are around Jesus maybe came to see him for who he was um, at the, and in, in a similar way on two levels, on the physical level and the symbolic level. On the first level, they were able to see Jesus by what he was able to do. They witnessed his wonder-working power. That always makes me want to sing, but I'm not saying the power of God to you this morning. His wonder-working power, his authority to forgive sins, his popularity with people on, and the crowds. On the reverse hand, his unpopularity with the powers of be, And then all the consequences that that led to. This is only partial vision. This is seeing dimly to me a glimpse of who he is and what he came to do. What's the next level? When we look more intently, when we focus and we're able to see him for who he truly is. We're able to see Jesus. Now if you have WhatsApp, I have WhatsApp, I have several groups and as Mark was saying earlier on, my sister's getting married on Saturday so my phone pings constantly. Because I have a group for bridesmaids, I have groups for my mom and my sister, I have another group for this, another group for that, and I have another group with my best friends, both of whom have kids, and my friend has two twins, toddlers. And she sent us a video of her twins sitting, surrounded with all of their little Bible books, and Eva picks up her book, tries to read it to her brother, and says, Zach, do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus? Do you see him? Do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus? see Jesus over and over and over again. Do you see Jesus that? You've got to see him. This two-stage journey of full vision, the, man, the blind man sees not only the people around him um, as, as trees, but he sees Jesus before him. The restorer of his vision, his healer, the son of God. And it's a similar journey for the disciples. They finally see Jesus for who he truly is. We might wonder, as I've said earlier on, why Mark puts these two episodes into one. The healing of a blind man straight into Jesus asking his disciples who they think that he is. And we see that there are parallels between the two stories. Like Jesus leads the blind man outside the village before he restores his sight. He leads the disciples away from Bethesda to Caesarea Philippi. Now it's quite a walk from Bethesda to Caesarea Philippi. If you were in a car on modern roads, it's a journey of an hour or two. It's even further if you're on foot on ancient roads. 
From Bethesda is up on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Caesarea Philippi is away up north on the slopes of Mount Hermon by the source of the Jordan River. If you climb higher and on a clear day you can see right down and over the Jordan Valley. It seems like an interesting place to have this conversation or to have these two episodes of vision and seeing um, together. Mark's Gospel is written in two parts, almost the first is Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the second happens in Caesarea Philippi where he leads his disciples off towards. So this episode where he is asking his disciples who they think he is, is kind of a turning point in Mark's Gospel. From the beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry to uh, the the second part of his earthly ministry, where they go down from Mount Hermon into the Jordan Valley and then up into that ascent into Jerusalem for Jesus' final days of his earthly ministry. So it's here in this remote and private place that Jesus asks these all important questions. Who do you say I am? Who do people say that I am? So like the, the, the blind man, the disciples were partially Blind. They could see what he was doing, they were experiencing what he was doing, and his identity is revealed as Peter makes this declaration, you are the Messiah. If you go back just one part um, into uh, the earlier part of Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, the disciples and Jesus are in the boat. And they've forgotten to bring bread, they're obviously out in the boat for the day, and they're fretting about the fact that they've got no bread. And Jesus says to them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? Do you not remember why you were worrying about bread or with me? Do you not yet understand? I've just had a bit of an object lesson and then Jesus healing the blind man. He brought the man from darkness to dimness to full clarity. They were not in complete darkness, as I just said. They witnessed God at work in Christ. They had seen him heal and forgive and make miracles. They had witnessed things that were out of this world. Yet Jesus had just rebuked them and said to them, Do you still not get it? You still don't understand. Do you not see what's before you? When they, he asked them, who do you say I am? They might as well have said, well, I see Jesus, I see you, but you might as well be a mighty walking around. I understand a bit, but I'm not really too sure. So Jesus asks them, what's the word? What's the word in the street or the equivalent of the street in biblical times? Who are they saying I am? The answer he gets is, a prophet. Some say you're actually John the Baptist, you're actually Elijah. You're not getting a tick on the homework for those answers. We ask them again, but who do you say I am? And Peter answers for the group. He says, you are the Christ. You are Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Matthew also describes this incident and or this instance and he puts it like this and Simon Peter had answered you are the Messiah the son of the living God and Jesus answered him blessed are you Simon Peter son of Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father in heaven Peter is saying we know who you are I'm confessing it with my lips we know you are the Messiah I know that you are the son of of the living God. I know that you are the Christ. Shortly before we heard our Bible reading and we're standing, you're sitting listening to me, we affirm that we believed in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If when we stand and affirm that we believe in the words of the Creed, when we stand to say who Jesus is, we're saying, I know who he is. I know that he is the Messiah. I know that he is the Son of the living God. And when we know that deeply, when we understand that deeply within ourselves, those words that Jesus spoke to Peter, blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, those words are yours, yours too. Blessed are you who knows deeply that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. 
It's not something that we just learn for, from picking up a book or from, this, from Sunday school or uh, somebody just telling us. It's inspired by the Word of God. It's spoken to us from the Father's heart. It comes from the Father's heart to our hearts. Because if we know that the Son of the Living God is Jesus Christ, it is because we have sought him out for ourselves. He has revealed himself to us through his word, through prayer, through praise, through other people. Our eyes have been unveiled and we have been allowed to see him for who he truly is, the Son of God. Matthew 13 says this, Blessed are your eyes for they see, your ears for they hear. Blessed are you because you've been able to see him. So when we're struggling, when we're downcast, when we're envious of the things that other people have, when we're unsure about which direction we're going here, going in next, we can hear and remember those words. Blessed are you, for you have been able to see the most precious and priceless treasure that there is in this world and in heaven. You have been able to recognize that pearl of great price that is Jesus Christ, and that is the greatest blessing of all, and that is one that we take with us. When we know him deeply, when we know him intimately, he walks with us. He is ours and we are his. And that is the greatest blessing we can enjoy as followers of Jesus Christ, to know him as our friend and saviour and Lord. We need to keep that knowledge, that identity of Christ as our Lord and Saviour firm in the forefront of our vision. So that when we affirm we believe in the words of the creed and our hymns and in our prayers, we know that we know that we know what we're saying is true for us, is true in us and in our church community, that we are affirming that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Messiah, truest friend, greatest saviour, pastor, teacher, leader, master, saying it with our lips and letting it be lived out in our lives. So that our lips, our hearts, our actions say the same thing. I know Jesus Christ as he is, as my Lord and saviour, as Messiah. I have come to him, I've come to the Father through him, and I am known by his name. As a Christian, as a follower of the Son of the Living God, and I live and speak and act as His child. So when we hear those words, "Who do you say I am?" What will your answer be? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the greatest blessing that is Jesus Christ. And the greatest joy it is to know him as our friend, as our saviour, as our teacher, our Lord and Master. As the one who walks alongside us. As the one that we can know deeply and intimately. So that everything that we do and think and say be in his name. So as, in, as we continue in worship and praise, we keep him at the forefront of our minds. We look to him as the Son of the living God, Messiah and Saviour. So we continue our service together with some prayers. Prayers prompted very much by those questions of Jesus in that passage in Mark's Gospel that Emma has just expounded. Heavenly Father, we contemplate our outer words and our inner actions when this day or later this week we come upon a person. Do we really ask the question, 
Who are you? Or honestly, if we reflect on our attitudes as well as our words, is really what we do when we meet someone ask, what are you? What tribe are you? Are you enemy or friend? Are you above me or beneath me? Are you a threat? Or are you unimportant? Lord, we are horrified by the verbalization of such an attitude. We know from God's instruction and God's own words that he saw everything he made and it was good. And every one he made is made in God's image and likeness. So when we meet, and when we meet a person we either know very well or don't know at all, prompted by God's word at this passage in Mark's Gospel, we need to govern our inner emotions and our outer words and ask the right question. It is a thrill to meet a child of God in a general sense and potentially a child of God through Christ in a spiritual sense. Lord, forgive us for the inappropriate and the unchristian wrong questions, verbalized or not, when we come into contact with another person. And we can deepen this sense of prayer and this cry to God for help when we meet someone uh, we know very well or we don't know at all. There is something clicks within us that says, what can I get out of this? Not what can I give to this person? How high up the ranks can I climb on the back of this person if necessary? Not how can I serve more effectively? And again, those often unspoken but very clear responses or questions when we meet someone how far are we from the image of our Saviour who stoops to the ground and washes his disciples' feet? Lord, we need to really reorder our emotions and, and practice your gift of self-control in our words and in our inner attitudes. Do we really want to go through life seeing, as it were, wooden trees stumbling about, not people, as God would have us see people? So Lord, we pray for your help to plant your word and your spirit deeply within our hearts and of our minds, that our words and our attitudes, our emotions and our trails of thought may be more people honouring and God honouring and scripture honouring. And Lord, not just for a day or two, but a lifetime as we seek to follow our Lord and Saviour day by day. Jesus asked, who do people say I am? Who do you say I am? Lord, we have that questioning and that opportunity to respond with each conversation, with each coming together, with each friendship, with each work relationship, with each family relationship, with each chance encounter in these days. Lord, Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the challenge that this is to follow Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for Bishop George and the team and the diocesan office and our team of bishops as they begin to work out uh, our response to the government uh, announcement just on Thursday past that some more freedoms and some additional changes to uh, not just society but how church can be. Uh, I think from the 26th of July, if my dates are right, Lord grant wisdom, grant a skill, practicality, timeliness and clarity in their communication 
as we with the rest of society are burdened with this really confusing and difficult task of trying to do more, more often with more people safely. It is far from a straightforward uh, decision. And Lord, we pray uh, as we receive instruction from, from Bishop George and his team uh, for our own vestry and wardens here in the parish that we would tread carefully and make safety of every soul that worships, every soul that gathers for any reason, our number one priority. Lord, grant great wisdom, grant great clarity of thought and communication as uh, the House of Bishops will, will meet and discuss and react and relay their reaction to these latest changes in COVID restrictions later this month. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We take a moment of quiet, personal prayer. And in the space, allow God's Spirit to prompt people and things we need to bring to God personally in a time of prayer. So we bring our thoughts and our prayers and our intentions together. Together we bring them to God in the famous words of the Lord's Prayer, praying together, Our Father. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Our thanks today to Sinclair and Barry and the team for looking after us and booking us in safely to, to Finn. Uh, who will shortly jump onto the organ stool for our final hymn for leading us in worship. And I'm talking like this then so that you do jump onto your organ stool because the hymn is coming next. Uh, we, we're grateful to see Finn grow up so quickly, literally grow up so quickly and, and to uh, show such enthusiasm for playing the organ for us. This is his first time on his own. Normally Ian or somebody else would be here uh, to look after him, but he's been flying solo today. Finn, thank you. Let's give him our hands. <laughs> no pressure for the final hymn now. <laughs> Did he hear this? Uh, we're going to stand and sing together a fantastic, uplifting hymn of praise. If you're using your hymn book, hymn number 366, if not, the words are on the screen. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
closing prayer and blessing. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit equip us to serve and worship you now and always. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all those whom you love now and always. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your seats and remain in your seats until one of our family's words tells you it is time to leave. May God go with you, bless you and keep you today.